This video is sponsored by Sleep Doctor. In this lesson, we are talking about the consequences of sleep apnea. So some of these consequences are going to be more mild, and some of them will be quite significant and severe health complications if sleep apnea is left untreated. Before we talk about those consequences, let's talk about what sleep apnea is. So sleep apnea is a set of conditions involving disrupted breathing or decreased airflow during sleep. I call it a set of conditions because there are multiple types of sleep apnea. One type is known as central sleep apnea, which occurs when there's no effort to breathe for greater than 10 seconds. There's something called obstructive sleep apnea, which occurs when there's a decrease in airflow for greater than 10 seconds in the presence of breathing effort. And then there's mixed sleep apnea, which may start out as central sleep apnea and then become obstructive sleep apnea. So it's a mix of central and obstructive. So each of these types of sleep apnea are going to have different risk factors. Central sleep apnea often is going to be related to either certain medication use or brain injuries like a stroke, for instance. Obstructive sleep apnea is going to often be related to things like obesity, for instance. Now, with regards to all of these types of sleep apnea, the prevalence increases with increasing age. So as we get older, the prevalence increases. Now, some of the estimates for the prevalence of sleep apnea can be anywhere from 5 to 10% of the general population, upwards of a third of the general population, and males are going to be more likely to be affected than females. Now, quickly, before we talk about those consequences, some of the signs and symptoms of sleep apnea can include snoring, nighttime awakenings, so the decrease in airflow can awaken the patient, and insomnia, so patients may have difficulty sleeping or they awake early and are not able to get back to sleep. Now, the topic of this lesson is that sleep apnea can cause a variety of consequences, health consequences, very significant health consequences, in fact, and these need to be thought about and patients need to be aware of these consequences in order for us to prevent them from occurring. So treating the sleep apnea earlier on before the consequences become too severe. So some of those consequences we're going to talk about include sleep disruption. This makes sense. If you're not getting enough breath during the night, you're not going to get a good sleep. So we're going to get decreased sleep quality and sleep duration. So if we were to look at this sleep cycle graph here, it's a hypnogram, there are multiple stages of sleep. So the first stage of sleep is stage one, then stage two, then stage three and four are often now combined into simply slow wave sleep. This is going to be the deepest level of sleep. And then then the slow wave sleep often goes back into stage two and then into REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. This is when we dream. So this is something that occurs multiple times throughout the night, the sleep cycle. So stage one, two, three, two, and then REM. And then as the night progresses, we're going to get less of the slow wave sleep and more of the REM sleep. Now, the reason I bring this up is because we are going to see sleep apnea occurring more frequently in rapid eye movement sleep. So when patients are dreaming, that's when they're going to be most likely to experience either an episode of sleep apnea or severe or significant sleep apnea. The reason is often going to be attributed to the fact that during REM sleep, there is muscle paralysis. And in some individuals, the muscles in the throat can also experience some of that paralysis as well. So when patients are trying to breathe, the musculature in the throat and neck is preventing airflow from getting past it. That's going to be obstructive sleep apnea. So we can have this occurring more commonly in rapid eye movement sleep. So this sleep disruption is going to lead to a host of different issues. Some of these can be simply daytime somnolence or daytime fatigue. You feel like even though you were sleeping throughout the night, eight, nine hours of sleep, you wake up and you feel tired or you feel very fatigued during the day. This can be due to the fact that you might have been having episodes of sleep apnea during the night, so you're not getting a good quality sleep. Decreased productivity. Now, this can be severe in some patients where they're prevented from being as productive as they could be. They just feel so fatigued, they're not able to do very much activity. Another important aspect of the sleep disruption is the fact that patients with sleep apnea, whether it be central sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea or mixed sleep apnea, they're at a higher risk of having motor vehicle accidents. Patients with sleep apnea are at two to three times more risk of having a motor vehicle accident than 
patients without sleep apnea. The reason, again, is often going to be due to the fatigue, issues with cognitive functioning, so sometimes they're not going to be as reactive as they could be, or even falling asleep at the wheel. These can all be things that can lead to an increased risk of motor vehicle accidents. This is going to be something you want to think about with patients who have sleep apnea. Another important consequence of sleep apnea is neuropsychiatric dysfunction. Now, neuropsychiatric dysfunction is going to be more due to long-term decreased sleep quality and sleep duration, as opposed to some of the effects we just talked about, like the daytime sleepiness, which can occur even with short-term decreased sleep quality and sleep duration. So what we're going to talk about here is going to be more related to long-term effects on disrupted sleep. So some of these can include cognitive issues. So cognitive dysfunction, we mentioned this briefly in the last slide with regards to productivity. So some of the cognitive issues that can occur with long-term impacts to sleep quality is decreased memory. Patients can have decreased short-term memory. They're not able to hold a lot of information in their short-term memory, so their working memory is impaired, or even issues with recall from their long-term memory. Decreased attention, so they're not able to focus as well as they used to be or as well as they should be able to. And decreased executive functioning, so decreased ability to plan decreased ability to arrange things that need to be done in a prioritized fashion. Those types of processes or those types of actions can be impaired with the decreased executive functioning. So that leads us into the sponsor of today's lesson, Sleep Doctor. Sleep Doctor offers an at-home sleep apnea test that is an FDA cleared device used to assess whether or not you have sleep apnea. Here is the at-home sleep apnea test. There are three components to this device. Here is the wrist sensor that attaches to your non-dominant hand. Here is the chest sensor that attaches to your chest. And here is the finger sensor, which is a pulse oximeter that checks the oxygen levels in your blood. So with these three sensors, even after only one night of sleep, you can get a lot of useful data. It's very convenient since you don't have to go into a sleep lab to get assessed. You can do it from the comfort of your own bed. So that's something I liked a lot. Getting into a sleep lab can be very difficult. It can take a long time to get into a sleep lab or it can be very costly depending on the country you live in. Unfortunately, a lot of times sleep apnea can go undetected and undiagnosed. So ensuring that you don't have sleep apnea can be very helpful in preventing any future health complications that sleep apnea might cause you. Please check out the link in the description below if you want to give this device a try. And now back to the lesson. Psychiatric issues can also occur. So patients with sleep apnea are at a higher incidence of the following conditions. Mood disorder, so they can be more likely to have depression as potential condition or anxiety, for instance. Another is psychosis. This is most likely going to be occurring in patients who have a predilection for psychosis in the first place. So if perhaps they have a history of psychotic disorders or psychotic related disorders like schizophrenia, for instance. If they have sleep apnea, it may trigger or increase the risk of having psychosis or psychotic episodes in those susceptible patients. And then personality changes. So along with the depression and anxiety, they can have personality changes as well. And again, all of this is going to be related to decreased quality of sleep, or disrupted sleep cycles. So the brain may not be able to go through slow wave sleep properly, which is very important in cleaning up some of the debris within the brain and also rapid eye movement sleep, which is helpful for memory consolidation, but not only that, but also with regards to processing past emotional experiences. And neurological issues can also be something that can occur with long-term sleep apnea. One of these is going to be increased risk of erectile dysfunction. So patients with sleep apnea are at an increased risk of erectile dysfunction. Now, we're going to get into more significant and severe consequences of sleep apnea. And some of these health consequences are going to start off with increased pulmonary vascular resistance. So increased pulmonary vascular resistance is going to be where the blood vessels in the pulmonary system, so the blood vessels that carry blood into the lungs, allow oxygen to diffuse from the alveoli in the lungs into the blood and then that blood return back to the heart, the pulmonary system can start to experience increased resistance. And the reason it does is because of alveolar hypoxia. So again, if there is decreased air coming into the lungs, either due to the fact that the patient doesn't have any effort of breathing, which would be 
central sleep apnea, or they have effort of breathing, but there's some obstruction. They're not able to get past the obstruction, often, again, due to musculature in the throat. That would be obstructive sleep apnea. Then there's not enough breath or air or oxygen getting into the lungs. And what happens is the lungs, the vasculature in the lungs, will constrict. We call this hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So the blood vessels really squeeze down. And the reason that the vasculature in the lungs does this is because the lungs are trying to maximize the amount of oxygen they are absorbing. So if there's less oxygen getting to the alveoli, the little air sacs in the lungs where oxygen actually crosses into the blood and taken up by the hemoglobin in the blood, if there's not enough oxygen, the lungs will vasoconstrict their own blood supply in order to direct blood into areas of the lung where it senses more oxygen coming in. So that is what's going to lead to increased pulmonary vascular resistance. But over time, this can lead to pulmonary hypertension. Hypertension means high blood pressure. When we think about high blood pressure, we're often thinking about the time when we put a blood pressure cuff on our arm and test our blood pressure. That is looking at systemic blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure on that reading with a blood pressure cuff on your arm, that's systemic hypertension. But we're talking about pulmonary hypertension here, and this is essentially increased pressures in the pulmonary system. So we have to look at this heart diagram. So if we're looking directly on the patient, here's the right side of the heart, here's the left side of the heart. So the right side of the heart is going to bring in deoxygenated blood from the venous system, from the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava into the right atrium that goes into the right ventricle that then pumps blood into the pulmonary system. Then that blood gets oxygenated and then that blood comes back to the left side of the heart into the left atrium, the left ventricle, and then that left ventricle then pumps the oxygenated blood into the aorta in the rest of the systemic circulation. So what we're talking about here is that there's going to be increased pressure in the pulmonary system. So then what happens then is that we can have issues with something called right ventricular hypertrophy. Now the reason this happens is because you can imagine if there's increased pressure within the pulmonary system, the heart is going to respond to that increased pressure by pumping even harder. So again, we talked about the fact that the blood from the right ventricle pumps into the pulmonary system. So the right ventricle is going to pump harder to get blood into that high pressure system. It has to because it needs to get blood in there to be oxygenated. So it starts to do this in over time, what happens is the right heart is going to get bigger. The musculature in the right heart is going to get bigger. It's like us working out our muscles. So the right ventricle gets bigger and bigger. That is right ventricular hypertrophy. So it becomes a big, thick, muscular right ventricle, bigger than it should be. You might think, why is that an issue? Well, the heart is not able to maintain that for a long period of time. And then over time, that big, thick, muscular right ventricle can become weakened itself. And that can lead to what we call core pulmonale. Now, core pulmonale is going to be a term we use specifically for isolated right-sided heart failure due to a pulmonary etiology. So because of that increased pulmonary blood pressure, that pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle has to pump harder and harder. And then in doing so, the musculature of the right ventricle becomes bigger and bigger. And eventually that right ventricle will fail and that will lead to right-sided heart failure. And the term we use, core pulmonale, means a right-sided heart failure that is due to a pulmonary cause. So what we just talked about, pulmonary hypertension leading to a right-sided heart failure. And it's going to be isolated right-sided heart failure. So we're not going to have left-sided heart failure in core pulmonale. So that's what core pulmonale is. And then when you have right-sided heart failure, you're going to have a backup of blood into the venous system. So backup into the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, because the right side of the heart's not pumping that blood as it should into the pulmonary vasculature. So blood backs up. So we can have issues like jugular venous distension. So if you look at a patient's neck, their big vein in their neck, the jugular vein can become distended. There's more blood in that vein because it's not able to get pumped by the right heart as it should be. And then the blood can also back up and cause peripheral edema. So swelling of the legs and feet can also lead to ascites. So a big fluid filled belly. And all of these are going to be due to the fact that the right heart has failed and is not pumping blood into the pulmonary vasculature as well as it should be. Even though we said there can be pulmonary hypertension, there can actually also be systemic hypertension from sleep apnea. And 
this systemic hypertension, again, is going to be in the systemic system. So in the last slide, we look at the diagram of the heart, the left side of the heart specifically, the left ventricle pumping blood into the aorta and into the systemic circulation. That is going to be the systemic system. And we can see systemic hypertension or high blood pressure in the systemic system in sleep apnea as well. The reason is because of increased sympathetic tone. And why that happens is because due to hypoxia during the night, we can have increased catecholamines. The body tries to respond to that low oxygen level by increasing catecholamines like norepinephrine and epinephrine to try to increase breathing and lead to systemic vasoconstriction and some of those other effects as well. It's all going to increase systemic blood pressures. And importantly, if we're to follow a patient throughout the entire day, even including when they're sleeping, if we're checking their systemic blood pressure with, say, a blood pressure cuff, we would find that the blood pressure is the highest during rapid eye movement sleep. And the reason, again, is because we're going to see more episodes of sleep apnea during this stage, as we mentioned before. Because, again, if they have, for whatever reason, more of their throat and neck musculature becoming too relaxed during that stage of sleep, they can have more obstruction of airflow leading to more apneic episodes. So this is the reason why we can see higher blood pressure during REM sleep. And this can itself all lead to eventual cardiovascular disease, more specifically congestive heart failure. So again, we look at this diagram here. So what happens again is that the oxygenated blood comes back to the left side of the heart and the left atrium, left ventricle. Left ventricle then pumps that oxygenated blood into the systemic system. And the ensuing cardiovascular disease can be multifactorial. So multiple factors can contribute to it. One that ties in with what we just mentioned here is long-standing systemic hypertension. So again, it's the same process we just talked about with regards to core pulmonale, where if there is high systemic pressures, the left side of the heart, the left ventricle, has to pump harder against that higher systemic pressure. And that's going to lead to a thickening and more muscular left ventricle. Eventually, over time, though, that left ventricle will fail and then there will be less blood being pumped into the systemic circulation. And what can happen is the blood can then back up from the left ventricle into the left atrium and into the pulmonary system. And that can increase pulmonary pressures because there's more fluid in the pulmonary system. And then eventually that can lead to increased pulmonary pressures where the right ventricle has to pump harder against those pulmonary pressures, eventually leading to right ventricular hypertrophy and eventually to right-sided heart failure. So again, systemic hypertension, especially long-term, long-standing, untreated systemic hypertension can lead to left-sided heart failure by the mechanism we just mentioned. That can lead to a backup of blood into the pulmonary system. That's going to lead to particular signs and symptoms. These include dyspnea on exertion, so shortness of breath on exertion. They're not able to do physical activities as well as they could without becoming short of breath. They can get orthopnea, shortness of breath when lying down flat, and they can also get paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is where patients, when they're sleeping, they wake up in the middle of the night totally out of breath. So that's paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Those all occur from a left-sided heart failure. And we just mentioned over time, all that fluid in the pulmonary system can eventually lead to increased pulmonary pressures right ventricular hypertrophy and eventual right ventricular failure and right-sided heart failure. And that can occur from a left-sided heart failure as well. So in that case, that would not be core pulmonale. Core pulmonale is again, right-sided heart failure that's isolated, that is caused by a pulmonary cause. But in this case, the ultimate cause is the left-sided heart failure. So in fact, the number one cause of right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure. So that's important to point out here as well. I hope you found this lesson helpful. Please check out my lessons on central sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea for treatment methods for helping to treat these conditions before these consequences occur. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.